Welcome to this call-in edition of Just Ask Us and a chance to talk to a pair of natural history experts about birds flocking to your neighborhood. Dr. Drew Lanham, a certified wildlife biologist in the Clemson University's Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, is joined in the studio today with Clemson University naturalist Patrick McMillan, director of the South Carolina Botanical Garden and host of Expeditions with Patrick McMillan. Was that an Acadian flycatcher or a pine warbler at your suet block? Find out how to identify birds by what to look for by calling in your questions and observations. Just use our toll-free number to join the conversation. It's 1-888-539-8859. That's 1-888-539-8859. And it's all yours, guys. Good morning, everybody. Hey, y'all. It's time to talk birds and birding with uh, my friend Patrick McMillan, who will be here shortly. But we've got a special guest this morning. A special guest. Patrick just walked in. Uh, But our friend and sponsor, Terry Allen of uh, For the Birds, is here. And Patrick is here in his jaunty cap. Oh, does he look dapper. Good morning. uh, We're here at uh, Ask Us. Just Ask Us on WFBSFM.com, 107.9 WFBS. We want you to give us a call today at 1-888-539-8859. Talk birds, birding, be a bird nerd, all that stuff with us. (laughs) How you doing, guys? I'm great, Drew. I barely got here. I'm sorry. I was given a final exam today. And I, 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 you know, since it is sort of these late fall, winter fruits. Yeah. um, Oh, my goodness. My of course, I teach plant taxonomy, so uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I always make a uh, a feast for the the final exam. This is ponche. 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 Tell us about ponche. Traditional Mexican um, Christmas and New Year's uh, punch drink. Oh, so wow. it's a cinnamon infused, lots and lots of sugar cane, lots and lots and lots and lots of sugar. But um, its primary ingredient, the thing that makes it ponche, is a critigus, a hawthorn. Ah, uh, yes. Is, the birds there are we eating go. hawthorns right now, and and so are we. So this wonderful hawthorn, as big as a um, as big as a crab apple, is Critigus mexicana, which is found in the highlands of Mexico. So it's a traditional central uh-huh. Mexican Christmas drink. So if you want some spice, there may or may not be a little rum. Oh, you know what? I was just going to ask because that I get a chance then to play cedar wax wing, you know, and we can, That's it. That's we, it. we can get some sort of fermented fruit here. Yeah. <laughs> kind so, of thing going on. But isn't that something that, um, you know, we're always talking about how important these fruits are that actually hang out Gracias. during the winter and into the early spring when, you know, uh, good carbohydrate rich, starch rich, sugar rich foods are not really everywhere to be found. So what do you think? Oh, this is delicious. I'll tell you, folks, this has gone from the bird show to the bird and culinary show. Oh, yeah. as, as Patrick, a uh, renaissance man, truly brings a treat into the studio. And let me tell delicious. you. Delicious. Not bad for ponche. bird food. Ponche. Good, good yeah, stuff. Ponche. You know, and this is the kind of stuff, Patrick, that would be great, you know, at a compilation after, a, I don't know, a Christmas bird count. Yeah. You oh, know? Yeah, make ponche. The problem is uh, finding Tejo Cody. Oh, yeah, of course. I, you know, we could just come to you, right? <laughs> yeah, you can go to Atlanta. I think that's the closest place you can get us where I have to go get them for my lab. So. Well, again, it's it's great to, to be in a place where we can talk birds and birding with uh, fellow bird nerds, with Terry and with my good friend Patrick here. And um, it's final exam week. We are in the midst of... Uh, of, of finishing things up here, but in many ways, things are just getting started with the birds. If you look at the BirdCast um, on BirdCast.com, what you'll begin to see is that waterfowl are beginning to move in. Waterfowl are beginning to move in. The sparrows seem to be here in abundance. Some folks have birds at their feeders. Other folks don't have so many birds at their feeders. So we want to hear from you today. We want you to just ask us. Maybe you'll just tell us. What's going on with the birds in your area at 1-888-539-8859. And I want to give a shout out, of course, to Terry, who's here with us today. He's our sponsor. And uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your store, Terry? Well, this is a good time of year for the store. Uh, We've got a lot of new items that um, people can um, enjoy and also get for Christmas. We've got these. I put I brought these gorgeous prints on wood over here did you see those on the way yeah beautiful just gorgeous uh, bird pictures 
that will be outstanding in somebody's uh, home. Uh, but it's a it's a great time of year, and uh, we're getting a lot of customers into the store right now. And where are you? We're in, on the way to Salem, not all the way into Salem. We're about uh, near Kiwi Key. There's a Key Mart there, and not Kmart, Key Mart. <laughs> <laughs> and next to the wine emporium on Route 130. All right. All right. Well, um, stop by, see Terry at For the Birds, pick up some right. gifts for friends, family, or me. and um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget me. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll be gratuitous here. But good things are going on. Um, can lots, I, yeah, go yeah, ahead, Patrick. Can I bring something up here? Yeah. I, I saw something bizarre. You? No. Something bizarre? I didn't see it, but I saw it come across my feed. Okay. Let's talk snail kite for a minute. Oh, man. You see, you beat me to it. There you go. <laughs> Le- there you go. Snail kite. Lake so, Conesty. Lake Conesty, yeah. There was a sighting of a snail kite. And mm-hmm. um, some folks, uh, including James, my mate, went out to try and, and look at it uh, on Sunday. They yeah. weren't successful seeing it on Sunday, but apparently it was seen on Saturday mm-hmm. uh, at Lake Conesty. And here is a bird, the snail kite. Endangered species, uh, limited primarily to Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge in extreme South Florida, over into the Big Cypress Swamp in Collier County, and, mm-hmm. and up into the Central Florida a little bit, but really just in the southern tip of Florida. And this is only the second record for South Carolina. I think one was on Lake Murray. A few uh, I saw the one in Lone Star. Lone Star it was one in Lone Star at a at a, at a crayfish farm. Yeah, um, weird bird, great bird, but Lake Conesty. Yeah, it seems strange. But Lake Conesty, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> is uh, kind of the central park of sorts for mm-hmm. Greenville County. Mm-hmm. Uh, my friend, our friend Dave Hargett, who's the executive director there, runs this wonderful, um, this wonderful acreage that's uh, that was pretty devastated by toxins and so forth. But it's at the basin of Greenville, so it gets all of this water um, sits on the Reedy River. And uh, you go there, you're going to see birds. You're going to mm. see lots of birds. Seeing a snail kite, though, I mean. It's pretty cool. It was a banded cool. bird. Yeah. Yeah, it bands on both yeah. uh, both legs. So de- interesting. To definitely a Florida bird that has uh, wandered that far away. And it's just going to show you, like, go bird watching. You think you've seen every bird in South Carolina? <laughs> go nah. see a snail kite or a Scots Oriole or, you know, these crazy things that have been showing up. Well, you know, again, when we, when we think about where we are and we think about the time of year, Again, you know, the birds that are visiting our backyards, we're used to our cardinals, our juncos. The juncos are, are in. We're thinking about white-throated sparrows and chickadees and titmice. And, you know, here comes this bird from, really, from the tropics. Um, because you With, find yeah. that, yeah. you know, With you, a bill that's made to extract apple, apple snails. snails. These great big snails. <laughs> wonderfully, <laughs> wonderfully adapted bird. But it, it goes to show you, Patrick, because I think the first few people who saw that bird maybe passed it off as something it's got a white rump patch right they they probably harrier. passed that bird mm-hmm. off as a harrier yeah and you know it bears repeating that you know you look at the common birds time and time and time again so that when something rare shows up you'll know what it is and there's always something rare to see always, always. Cool out there yeah we've always. had we've had boobies in south carolina <sighs> we've had boobies <laughs> <laughs> we we've had all of these things so you know what this is uh, this is John from Evansville, who I have a feeling I might I just might know this bird. John, are you on with us? I'm on with you. I'm a complete stranger. You don't know me. We've <laughs> never seen each other. Ever. <laughs> this is my friend John Scott Foster, if I'm not mistaken, up in Eville. How are you today, John? I'm good, and and we've been actually getting a call here at Wesleyan Nature Society at our nature center, and I can't answer it because I'm a snake guy. But <laughs> a lot of, of people in town you know, have noticed that the birds aren't coming to their feeders. Wow. We've had a pretty mild fall so mm-hmm. far, but I must have had three or four calls from concerned old folks that are going, the birds are <laughs> gone. I don't know where they are. And I haven't been calling them back because I don't have an answer. And I said, today I'll get one. Well, John, thanks for thanks for that that question, man. And um, and and Wesselman Nature Center is a, a great place, and um, I've spent some time up in in your neck of the woods, and look forward to doing it again. But you know, that's a that's a question that's coming out of Indiana. It's coming out of lots of places. And our friend Terry just asked that question, Patrick. Salem, you yeah. know, in in nearby Salem, which is kind of like Eville in some ways, John Scott. But you know, when we think about um, 
what's going on. We've had this this pretty warm winter. And, um, you know, as scientists, as, as observers, we always think about the variation in nature, just this amazing variation, right, Patrick? Mm-hmm. And, um, and part of what um, we would hypothesize that we would theorize um, is going on is that birds are finding stuff elsewhere um, and, uh, and that their, their insects certainly hanging on, I would guess. John, is it still buggy up there in ways? I mean, have you guys had killing frost yet? Um, we really haven't had a killing frost yet, no. Yeah, um, I, you know that that the birds are taking advantage of the very of the variability mm-hmm. um, environmental condition that's out there, and so um, not sooner but later <laughs> they'll be back. Um, they'll come back, you know. And that whole philosophy that we have of feeding birds kind of if you fill it they will come. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think holds true. So if you can get your folks in Evansville just to be a little more patient. And understand that um, as great as we think we are as humans and feeding birds, that maybe nature might be a little better at it. And, you know, I think their worry is that, you know, you hear so many things bad that are mm-hmm. happening to the environment that I think they are, that the concern on a lot of people is just another silent spring that something has been <laughs> done that, that's killing them and not that they're just getting a better meal somewhere else. Well, so. Well, well, John, that's a that's a great point, Patrick. What do you think about that? Because um, well, you really want to know what I think about it. Now. Yeah, um, I do. Well, John, we you know here, uh, I'm, I'm the director of the South Carolina Botanical Garden, and of course, our our feeders have been packed with birds. I mean, just packed with birds. Mm-hmm. But not only that, but the garden, the core of our garden, has been packed with birds this year. But you don't see a lot of birds when you leave the garden. And that's because we have a core that's watered. <laughs> and so we've been able to maintain mm-hmm. a little bit of, of living vegetation. And, um, you know, the situation we've dealt with is it's ridiculous. Like, we, we had 3.7 inches of rain from April 1st till November 30th or whatever it was. Yeah, it's in, been really dry here first. as well. So we had, well, we had half the rain that Tucson, Arizona gets got this summer. <laughs> um, so that's Sorry. pretty, that's, yeah, it's, it's pretty extreme. And, you know, we've seen... Lots of tree death. We've seen massive drop off in uh, insect populations, crash in insect populations, unless you're, you know, in these core areas mm-hmm. that have water, like the botanical garden. It's so an oasis. It's been an oasis here for us, but elsewhere, you know, it's it's pretty desperate. Um, and now, of course, it's rained like <laughs> four or five <laughs> days straight. We've had like seven inches of rain, and you know, that's the way things go. It's, it, we're, we're seeing more and more extremes in our weather, and and you know, if you think you're not, then you don't go outside. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> we are seeing more extremes in our weather and that, that pattern is very worrisome. So Drew, it's, I mean, I'm there. I'm like, I am worried about the next silent spring because I think it is coming in, in the form of a changing world. And I don't think we're doing enough to prepare or to deal with that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, um, when you look at some of the, some of the estimates and the number of birds that we're losing, it's startling. You know, and we're faced daily with bad news of all kinds about the environment. Um, and so, yeah, there is there is cause for concern. I think there's always cause for concern. And, you know, link the words conservation, concern, um, you know, they they, they kind of walk hand in hand. So, you know, I think a, a healthy dose of concern is always is always warranted. And so us understanding um, and Terry, you sent me an article the other day, I think, from you sent us an article from the Washington Post, Yeah, you know, that talked about this and, and what people are seeing. And so those are certainly concerns. So, you know, it's it's maybe it's also an opportunity to move people to action. You know, it's an opportunity. Well, it, thank you much. I, I appreciate having the the clout of being able to say Dr. Lanham, wildlife ecologist at Clemson, says, rather than, well, I think. <laughs> so have well, a beautiful day and happy holidays. All right. Thank Thanks. you, John Thanks, Scott John. Foster. Take yeah. care. Well, I mean, great call from, from our friend John Scott Foster, who who's a herpetologist, but just also a wonderful, wonderful naturalist up there in Evansville. Um, but, but guys, uh, you know, it is something, you know, and, I, and as I tell people, you know, the birds will come back, the birds will come back. Um, you'll get birds back at your feeder, but we do know that populations of some of our common birds are suffering. You know, birds that we formerly took for granted. Sure. Yeah. I mean, well, and of course, one thing we talk about all the time is um, 
the loss in certain what we call ecological guilds of birds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not just talking about changing in climate, but we're talking about changes in land use patterns that manifest themselves in massive changes in birds. So some species that are in incredible steep decline in the southeast, for instance, like eastern meadowlarks, uh, bobwhite quail, um, bobolink, (laughs) you know, all these birds that, um, that, that formerly um we're here in large numbers today are not and it's for the reason that we've changed land use so Mm -hmm. you know not everybody has a cow and 40 acres of land that they keep (laughs) open or plowed or whatever uh today it's a it's you know it's a changing world and there's many more trees and there's a lot more forest and so there's less space for this ecological guild we call early successional habitat Mm -hmm. birds or grassland birds which are in decline not just here worldwide yeah yeah it is you know and and often we've we've sort of been um i don't know um forested um in 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 our minds to think about only the birds that live in mature forest environments but um, patrick is exactly right a lot of the birds that we're used to seeing and i like to think about these birds as being connected culturally Mm -hmm. to who we Mm -hmm. were in terms of small-scale agriculture agriculture that really um didn't clean row to row and ditch to ditch. Yeah, you bet. It, let's talk about one, golden wing warbler. Oh, my gosh. We never talk about golden wing warbler. Let's talk about this bird. Talk about one that's in steep decline. Mm-hmm. One of the most beautiful warblers that we have, one of the most beautiful birds on planet Earth. Um, if you want to reliably see one, you kind of have to see them on the wintering ground. Go to, like, Monte Verde. They, they winter there in uh, Costa Rica. It's one of, a very reliable bird to see in Monte Verde cloud forest. But they breed here. They breed in the mountains of the Carolinas. Um, and if, you, um, if you're lucky enough to see one, you're in a very special spot because these are birds that are connected to our uses. They don't like just fields. They don't like fresh clear cuts. They want blackberry thickets on the edges of fields that aren't mown, that are, oh, there's that song, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for me, I think about that bird being on Yellow Mountain, Roan Mountain area. Uh, up in the mountains of North Carolina, where we have had that culture, and, and in the county I grew up in, in Allegheny County, where we have blue wing and or, uh, and yellow wing, or, yeah, uh, golden, wing. golden wing warblers, um, in sort of the same habitat and the hybrids, you know. But that habitat's disappearing because it's it's a little temporal slice, yeah. And you have to have the agrarian and you know, the, the grazing, the agrarian, the agricultural base to provide the open land that then gets abandoned for a little while, that then grows up a little bit, that then has the birds for a few years, and then they shift out when it grows farther up into trees or they shift out if it goes to forest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, when we stop doing that as a culture, we see that manifest in the drop in the abundance of some of these beautiful species. And who knows what the future gold-winged warblers are. Well, I mean, you've got golden wings that we just heard that be um, that that require that early successional habitat. I, my lifer golden wing came up in the Hiawassee Valley. Mm-hmm. Now we'll get them in spring migration here. Botanical gardens, Botanical you can gardens see them every year. <laughs> um, but you know that's one of the things that we often don't um, don't think about is those early successional species. Prairie warbler, another yeah, bird. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up. Yeah, um, eastern towhees mm-hmm. that are declining. A backyard bird. You know, drink your tea. Mm-hmm. That bird that we that we think about. Um, that our largest sparrow is also suffering because of these these and these habitat declines and and you know ah, <laughs> there we go ah, yellow breasted chat right comical bird queer <laughs> it's you know one of the places one of the places that i go to find birds like this uh and it, they're all over the landscape, but but maybe not in the configurations they need to be for healthy populations, for sustaining populations. Powerline rights of ways. Yeah, reliable. Um, it, it's one of the few places that you can go to see some of these early successional birds. And you get that that wonderful trio: indigo bunting, prairie warbler, <laughs> yellow breasted yellow breasted chat. chat. And, you know, pr- those power line clearings are good. I'm not sure, you know, we've had a shift in management there where we, mm. we use, instead of mowing, we're using a lot herbicides, more herbicide. And that, that may be having a, I don't know, I haven't seen the research on that, so I can't say one way or well, another whether it's negative. But certainly, you know, big clear cuts are places these things like. This is where you find the largest populations is when you have a recent clear cut and it starts to grow back up. And so sometimes we think, see things that may look ugly in the landscape. 
well, there's some gems that that reside in those places. Well, I'll tell you that's uh, you know that's the that that's what I did my research on. Mm-hmm. I, I studied those those shrub scrub birds and things like prairie warblers and chats like big cuts. Um, these sort of large scale disturbances that naturally occur episodically with with um, with storms with fires. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things um, as we've had these these catastrophic fires in the southern Appalachians over the past few oh, weeks. Yeah. One of the interesting things to see, and, and we never want to see human um, harm and, and destruction, um, but one of the things to look for as we kind of study post-fire is to look at some of these bird populations to see how they, how they fare. Um, because, again, when we think about sort of you know, what some people like to refer to or think of as a balance of nature, um, we know that episodically these disturbances occur and birds mm-hmm. respond and they kind of move patchwork across a landscape. You know, in these, in these power line rights of ways, there actually are some programs to work with land managers to conserve birds. So, you know, you have different people doing different things who are trying, but what can you do as an ordinary citizen? Well, one of the things you can do is give us a call but that 888-539-8859, but then pay attention. You know, if, if you're not seeing the birds at your feeders, keep records. And if you've kept records for years, you know, what are you seeing that's different? That whole phenology, that is the order of things, the order of nature, the seasonality of when things are occurring. Patrick, on your um, changes that you've made in the botanical gardens where you've added that grass land, yeah. has that taken oh, hold and yeah. has had, had an impact on Absolutely. So we have about wildlife. nine acres now of unmown Piedmont Prairie. I mean, it's it's restored Piedmont Prairie. And um, it's amazing. I mean, we've uh, we never had even common birds like uh, red-tailed hawks. <laughs> they just didn't exist in the garden. I mean, they'd be flyovers, but they didn't exist. We have two breeding pairs now in the, in the garden. Great horned owls in the garden. Uh, white-crowned sparrows, savannah sparrows, mm-hmm. um, Lincoln sparrows. What else have we gotten out there recently? Swamp sparrows, Lincoln sparrows. I, I mean, pretty. Oh well, uh, vesper sparrows vesper. are out there right now, uh, this morning. Uh, so all the birds basically that you go to prairie type habitats in South Carolina see, we have. We've had dick thistles show up. We've had all these birds. You've had that, Easter meadowlarks. Easter out there. meadowlarks. Yeah. So, yeah, we see we see a response when we actually uh, provide the habitat, and you know we're one of the few places probably that has that habitat. And most people that drive through the garden, uh, the number one complaint I get is, when are you going to cut the grass in that vacant <laughs> lot over there? <laughs> but um, um, you know, it again. It's these rough and tumble places sometimes that provide the the balance that we need to mm-hmm. to keep life in there. And if you walk into that Piedmont Prairie in the any time during this growing season, it's not just the birds. But I mean, right now you should go if you if you haven't been over for a while, walk that trail. Man, the maritime forest habitat, mm. the Piedmont Prairie, the, the longleaf pine habitat um, exhibits through there, you will see thousands and thousands of of sparrows, particularly yeah. goldfinches, sparrows, things like that using that habitat right now. More birds than I've seen anywhere <laughs> I see there. Um, and it's it's pretty phenomenal to see the response that we've had with that. And, you know, that can happen. It's in only three years old, isn't it? Three years, yeah, yeah. Three years into it, and we've already got that kind of response. And, you know, this, having some spots in your yard, you know, or in your landscape, it doesn't need to be in your front yard. It can be anywhere, <laughs> unless you're like Philip Juris. He has, like, the best yard uh, in, in yeah, Athens. Yeah. It's a prairie in his front Love yard it. downtown. But, um, you know, the... If you have a place that you can allow to be a little scraggly and don't mow it every week, you know, let the thing grow up and maybe mow it once a year, um, in a, in corners, you'll you'll find a response. You'll find things like towhees and and indigo bunnings almost immediately respond to that. And those are birds that you know you're not going to bring to a feeder indigo bunnings very easily, but you're going to bring them to your yard um, if you have a little bit of rough and tumble grassy. Mm-hmm brambly area for them and it's a bird that breeds in brambles yeah yeah it, it is and, and and again you know it's sort of a, a shift in in what many of us are used to you know and as we dealt with the with this this drought hmm. that that you've talked about and we think about what that prairie what piedmont prairie here in south carolina how it's able to withstand and how some of our native species are able to withstand um some of these these conditions and things are changing yeah. You know, our th- things are changing. You know, the desert garden, 
Yeah, we <laughs> have two acres of desert garden now. The garden <laughs> is, 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 is doing thriving. It's, it's, yeah. it's doing really well. Mm. So I know Patrick keeps expecting a Lucifer's hummingbird. <laughs> yeah. um, or a cactus wren. Or a cactus wren. To sh- <laughs> I to sh- wanted that Scott's Oriole to show up, but <laughs> to it, show it up went out to six there. mile anyway. But y- you know, again, birds are barometers mm-hmm. for us, and mm-hmm. and they can tell us they can tell us many things. Such a quick response. Yeah. Such a quick response. So that's one thing you can you know that's a, a, a you know managing. I tell anybody who asks me about managing their property is manage a mosaic. You know, yeah. try to. Try to manage a mosaic. Manage for your use where you need your use for you and your family. There's nothing wrong with a lawn if you need a place to run, to hike, you know, whatever you're doing. But um, manage a mosaic mm-hmm. if you really want to enrich your life and live your life as full as you possibly can in this wonderful place in the state of South Carolina that has so much to offer. Live your life, meaning let life in. Right. Patchwork quilt. Left light. Let life in. Don't just don't just wipe it out. Yeah. 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 It's again, it, it's a, you know, for mow less wow who doesn't like that Hmm. you know one of the things when you look where you are whether it's in evansville or whether it's salem or seneca or clemson or wherever you may be you know look at the landscape um you know here there are opportunities you know we talked about lake conesty and what happened to that place and the ability to recover and how quickly birds have responded and how well the greenville bird club Mm -hmm has done in documenting the birds that are there and the tens of thousands of people that visit that green space that are exposed to nature. Well, there are other places, abandoned landfills, closed landfills Mm -hmm. that have the opportunity once again to be prairie, to be grassland, because by regulation, they can't grow trees on those places. Mm -hmm. They'll perforate the caps. And so those are wonderful (laughs) expanses. So, you know, at one point in time, we had talked with folks um, in a local, in one of the local municipalities here, about mowing less on those landfills, and then trying to get some native vegetation back um, to try to provide opportunities for things like grasshopper sparrows. I found more grasshopper sparrows on the Seneca landfill than almost anywhere else. Right, and that's another declining grassland species. So there, there are opportunities, there are opportunities for us to do good by nature. Um, in ways that maybe we haven't thought of. Yeah. You've got an article that you wrote a while ago about what people can do for their backyard, what kind of plants to put in their backyard, and what they can do to attract birds. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. That a PDF, and I can put it on our website mm, cool. for people to download it, which would be interesting for people to look at. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's you know, and Patrick talks about that, the patchwork, mm-hmm. you know, kind of this mosaic of, of things. And, you know, when you think about, you know, a lot of folks have, have their Christmas trees up, you know, and, and, and oftentimes it's easy for, if you're not, if you don't have a tree that you can plant, um, that you can continue to keep going, a lot of people are just going to take it to the mulcher. Mm-hmm. I don't do that. It, it goes into the corner of the yard. Mm-hmm. Um, I let brambles and all sort of stuff Winter grow up in it. habitat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's great. So yeah. I've actually got, a couple of three Christmas <laughs> yeah. trees that um, that are in the backyard now that are great cover uh-huh. for for all sorts of things. So it's simple things that you can do. Why don't you let us know what you're doing? Give us a call at one eight 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 five three nine eight eight five nine. Tell us what's going on in your neck of the woods. What's going on in your neighborhood, um, your city park, mm-hmm. um, your backyard. Let us know the birds you're seeing. You want to see. And um, talk to us about why you bird. We'd love to hear from you. So, Terry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it's going to be down to 25 degrees on Friday night. Mm. We're finally getting some good cold weather. Um, so what is your recommendation for what's in stock and what should we be doing to feed and keep the birds going through the winter? Suet's the one that seems to stand out because I guess they need the fat right. and the nutrition from suet. Um, and the other is to keep your your um, bird bath unfrozen, <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and, and uh, available for the birds. And of course, um, our Birdman's Blend is certainly a, an attractive um, feed for birds. But beyond that, it, you guys are the experts as far as attracting <laughs> well, birds in the suet, winter. But that suet's going to come in handy it come is. Friday. I mean, and and yeah, that's one thing I always like to keep people in mind of is that with high fat, and you don't have to worry about the um, 
high melting temperature suets this time of year. <laughs> no. You know, when it starts to get cool, um, load those birds up with suet. That's a, that's a great way to attract not just uh, birds to your backyard, but also birds that you might not see otherwise. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's an opportunity to get things like pileated woodpeckers, um, yellow rumped warblers. Yeah, I was just going to say suet. they're on my suet right you now. You know, pine yeah. warblers love mm-hmm. suet. You know, and I would, and and people are always we talk in this in the spring and, and summer, the breeding season, even to the migratory season, we we talk about um, hummingbird feeders, and you know, we encourage people to to keep those up and fresh. But then I also want to encourage people um, to be on the lookout, especially in the Midlands and on the coast, but to be on the lookout for Orioles. Of course, Baltimore Orioles winter with us all year long, and nothing would be more brilliant. Absolutely, Terry. Absolutely. Baltimore He's looking at Orioles? Baltimore Orioles. No. So this time of year, seeing that flash of orange and black in your backyard is entirely, entirely possible. So Down in the Midlands and on the coastal plain, it's every year. It's every year, yeah. you know, and grape jelly. Mm-hmm. And 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 orange halves are um are are what those are what those birds like. But you know, you talk about suet, and even I, you know, if, if I'm eating a good steak, I don't throw away <laughs> the fat. Um, and and physiologically, we do need that, and birds mm-hmm. certainly need that. So so energetically, and you know, you've heard us talk. You've heard us talk about not just water, but making water. How our bodies make water in this time of year yeah, metabolic water it's called yeah metabolic water yeah. it's it's important mm-hmm. um for for functioning so you think about um the drought that we just had and you think about the water that's now on the landscape in some places but your body also makes it internally so you can help in that way you know you can you can help in that way so again let us know what you're doing in your backyards are you seeing orioles you know i'm Patrick, I am kind of waiting for that Scott's Oriole, for a Scott's <laughs> Oriole to, to show back up. You know, that yeah. was a that was a magical bird. You know, the snail kite, a magical bird on the coast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Black guillemot yeah. are showing yeah. up. Um, and that's kind of an interesting sighting because as warm as the as the temperatures of the ocean water are right now mm-hmm. off the coast of South Carolina, it's kind of odd to think that's probably the northernmost breeding. Uh, Alcid, maybe that in Dovaki. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, way up there, particularly on the Pacific side. So, you know, to see something that's an auk showing up already in South Carolina is a little odd. But probably related, I think. I think it's a good chance we will see a lot of that because we had the, we had the lowest uh, extent of ice on the record ever right. in the autumn. Mm-hmm. So normally in October you're building ice and the ice just stopped building and yeah. it's it's still at a really low level and we had some really high temperatures all the way up over even over the North Pole all the way up into October. So it's been an odd year at the poles and um, they're just starting to lock the land and freeze up again. Well, I, you know, as I as I think about what's going on with birds and um, and and some of the people I depend on the most and some of the best birders you're going to find are waterfowlers, mm-hmm. are duck hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, they bird sometimes with a different intent, um, but most of them are great conservationists, um, save many more ducks than they ever take. But one of the things they can tell you is what's going on with, with duck populations, or at least with, with where they hunt and their favorite water holes and, and what's going on. And so what ducks will do, ducks will push south, but then ducks will quickly push back north. And so they're sort of on this constant flux and flow. So if you know any waterfowlers, if you're out looking for ducks, if uh, th- and this time of the year is the time to do it when you look at bird cast and, 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 and who's pushing down um, waterfowl-wise, um, the, water, the duck hunters will know. The duck hunters will be able to tell you. And so, you know, as you expand your sort of birding acumen, you know, uh, make sure you don't overlook those people. And I would encourage you, um, even if you aren't a waterfowler, go out, buy a duck stamp, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. a bird uh, a bird conservation stamp that uh, it's twenty five dollars. Now you can buy those things online. You can buy it at the post office. You can yep. buy them from a number of organizations, and that that money ninety eight cent of every dollar goes to the National Refuge uh-huh. System. So 
um, those are important things that you can do. And we always want you as uh, as birders, as lovers of nature, to think about what you can do sort of in your own little world to make things better. And, you know, if you are interested in duck populations and waterfowl populations, ducks, geese, um, pretty much anything you get sh- shoot at, <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, you can see the trend. Um, usually in August, they, they publish mm-hmm. the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service publishes the waterfowl population status and uh was just published in august 10th this year for the the season previous so we're looking at uh um the 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 ducks that are here this 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 autumn uh that will be 